Good evening. This is the September 21st, 2011 Constitution Meetup in Austin, Texas. I'm your host, John Rowland, and uh, we are today celebrating Constitution Day, which was this Saturday, the 17th. Uh, this is the anniversary of the <clears throat> approval by the Constitutional Convention of the draft of the Constitution, which was then sent to the states uh, to hold ratifying conventions to, to ratify it, which occurred on June 21st, 1788. Now, uh, <clears throat> when I started the Constitution Society back in 1994, uh, almost no one was celebrating Constitution Day. And for many years, very few people did. For many years, I was uh, more or less alone. I would do things like stand on the, at a busy intersection holding up a sign saying, honk if you love the Constitution. And I almost got arrested for doing that once. Uh, it's, a, it's an amusing story, and you can go to uh, my blog, uh, first click on uh, uh, constitution.org, then up the upper right-hand corner, click on the Constitution blog, and uh, do a search on how I almost got arrested and uh, you can get the story. Well, happily, things have changed somewhat. Uh, in the intervening years, the Constitution has become more popular. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to think that I had something to do with that. Uh, over the course of that time, uh, the number of visitors to constitution.org have been increasing by now over 40 percent per year. And that's uh, an indication that the, the topic has become much more uh, interesting to more people. Now, recently, uh, in order to raise a little extra money, I broke down and and did what I've been resisting doing for a long time, which was uh, putting ads on the constitution.org website. And you can see some of them on the screen behind me here. These are the ones on the home page. They're just small ads. I put them at the bottom. Uh, basically, five of them, a three of one kind and two of another. And I've been putting them on the most popular pages uh, throughout the site. I get statistics on uh, the most frequently visited pages, and I've been putting ads on those pages. And happily, also, uh, the <clears throat> estimated earnings for that are now running at about $800 a month. Uh, and the trend is upward. Uh, I don't know how high it will get, but uh, that's certainly encouraging. It will at least help pay the bills, which I'm having a lot of trouble paying these days. Uh, if anyone can, uh, this is a good time to make a donation through our website, uh, because uh, things are in danger of being shut down if I don't uh, raise some more money pretty soon. But if you absolutely don't have any money to donate, you can go to our website and click on as many ads as you can, because uh, that's one way to get money coming our way without you necessarily having to uh, send any. But don't use that as a substitute for sending money if you can at all afford it. Now, for example, 
this we've got one here uh, for legal zoom the ads are generally somewhat relevant to the topics of our page and in fact on um, as I go from page to page to page uh, where the topics are some, is somewhat more specialized, I find that Google is, uh, or their, their, out, their presentation algorithm for choosing which ad to put in this slot does seem to be uh, responsive to the topic on that page. So uh, uh, I've noticed as the week has progressed, it's been about a week since I started putting these ads on, that uh, the ads that Google is selecting seem to be getting more and more relevant to the pages that they're placed on. And uh, hopefully that trend will continue and that uh, it will bring in more revenue. For the meantime, don't forget, uh, you can uh, send us money by just clicking on, the, clicking on these ads. Here's one with LegalZoom. And uh, just back up to get out of it. And when you go back, you've got a different selection of uh, ads and they're arranged differently. Also, don't forget that uh, you, if you order through our button here, our banner, uh, if you're ordering anything from Amazon.com and order it through our website, uh, we get a cut of it. We could really use it. That's small but significant source of revenue. And if you need a uh, website hosting provider, if you click on DreamHost and tell them that you sent us, uh, that's another way that we can earn a little extra money. Now, um, several developments since our last meeting last month. Uh, it is once again redistricting time in Texas. And once again, the legislature has proposed a congressional map and of course also state legislative maps. And once again, uh, since the, legis the legislature is dominated by Republicans and they tend to draw maps that seem to favor Republicans, the uh, Democrats and affiliated groups, minority groups and so forth, are uh, suing to get the maps redrawn in their favor. And the way they do this, of course, there's one lead lawsuit, Lopez v. Perry. And there are a bunch of interventions by other parties. They come in, they file what's called an action and intervention. That's kind of like a uh, uh, plaintiff's petition, but instead of initiating the lawsuit, they're joining in as a third party. An intervener can come in on, on, the, on the side of one or the other of the two main parties, or they can represent a third position. Uh, I have often intervened in cases where I felt that neither side was representing the Constitution. So what I try to do is I intervene and present arguments to the court for uh, why the court should take a position differing from that of either of the two main parties, but which does support the Constitution. Now, I can't say that uh, these efforts have been spectacularly successful, but at least an intervention is more likely to be get attention than filing an amicus brief. In most court cases, uh, you file an amicus brief, called the, the, the long name is amicus curiae, 
meaning friend of the court, uh, all you're doing is making a suggestion. And the judges don't have to pay any attention to the amicus brief or even read them. And more often than not, they don't read them. With uh, an intervention, they probably at least read them. And in an intervention, the intervener, like other parties, can call witnesses uh, and offer evidence, make motions in court, and things of that sort, which an amicus cannot do. So it's a little stronger position to be in. And what we have here is uh, part one and two of my intervention, which is somewhat similar. if I can bring it up at all. I presume that uh, there's a higher standard needed to intervene. Okay, here we are. I don't know why the other one didn't come up. Is that right, John? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, you basically are in the same position as any other party. Now there are, each court has its own local rules. And this is illustrative of that. The U.S. District Court for the Western District of Texas San Antonio Division has its own local rules that for example, you have to spell out all of the parties. You can't just say et al, which is a common way of, of uh, uh, abbreviating it. And uh, the key thing here is the order, which is why I put it in a separate file. It is the, essentially very similar to the intervention I filed in 2006, well, 2001, 2003, really. And uh, in that case, the three judge panel, which was meeting in Marshall, Texas, uh, simply ignored all the interventions. Uh, they made a few tweaks to the map, and that became the map. Uh, and really no one was satisfied, but at least the, uh, the challengers, the, the Democrats and the uh, minority groups, uh, could go to their uh, constituents and say, look, we did something, uh, donate more money, uh, and oh yes, you now have, a, have an issue in the next election. Well, I'm not sure how much good that really does, because it just perpetrates the, or perpetuates the problem of having courts performing the judge, the, the job that the legislature is supposed to do. Uh, it should not be asked to do that. And uh, judges are not really qualified to be drawing maps. Uh, so what I proposed was we, that we let the computers do it. Uh, the state of Texas has excellent software, uh, two packages actually, one called Target, the other called Red Apple. Target can be used to actually draw maps on a screen. Uh, you can uh, put in the criteria that you want the maps to satisfy, the specifications, and uh, they just let it run and in uh, typically half an hour you get a pretty decent looking map and if you let it run for several hours you get uh, pretty good looking maps. And every one is different. Every time it runs it, draw, it draws a different map. It draws them at random. Now once you pick a map generated by Target 
you can send it over to this other package called Red Apple. And what Red Apple does is it translates the map into meets and bounds descriptions, uh, such as a surveyor would use. It, 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 and that becomes the legal uh, specification of the map that it then becomes a, a, a bill uh, passed by the, le the legislature. Now, Red Apple also lets you manually draw maps. And most of these maps drawn by uh, the Republican majority were actually drawn using Red Apple. They were drawn manually. And of course, they were drawn with this intent to advantage Republicans, and in particular, conservative Republicans. So, uh, uh, what I propose in my intervention and in the order which accompanies it is that Target be allowed to just draw the map, that draw a whole bunch of them. Uh, you, could, you would let, uh, allow for a certain number of strikes. Uh, members of the state Senate could uh, strike uh, could each strike one map, and they would only have about a third of the maps they could strike. And then the, the map that would be adopted would be drawn at random from among the ones that survived the striking process, sort of like impaneling a jury. And my contention is that this method of drawing maps should meet the Article 5 of the Voting Rights Act, uh, or Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, uh, because uh, there can be no discrimination if maps are not drawn by human beings. Computers can't discriminate. The, the, the algorithms that they use are known, it's open source, anybody can examine them. Uh, they, the ones that I propose only take into account five criteria that the maps be equipopulous, that they be compact, that they be contiguous, that they be simply connected, and that they minimize the number of political jurisdictions that they split. Those are the only five criteria. It does not in any way know anything about voting history or ethnicity or anything else, income, that's the only things that it considers is where the people are. And uh, if that were done, it's my view that you would get a map that is fair. Uh, it, would not, it wouldn't protect incumbents. It wouldn't necessarily avoid diluting minorities. But uh, I don't think that's important, that it should be done anyway. So uh, that's what I propose to the court. Uh, it was tried all of last week, and I haven't heard it yet, but it's, they're supposed to be making a decision right about now. And uh, we'll see how that turns out. In the meantime, uh, the Department of Justice to whom the map was submitted for pre-clearance, or the several maps, not just the congressional map, rejected the congressional map and the uh, state house map. It accepted the state senate map. So uh, that's going to have. That's also going to be litigated, uh, and the state of Texas, through the attorney general, has filed a suit. Uh, to bypass the Department of Justice and have a uh, the, uh, the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia decide the case uh, over the objections of the Department of Justice. So all of that is in litigation. I'm not going to try to intervene in D.C. Uh, it's just not practical to try to do that. But at least uh, if this case goes to the Supreme Court, 
my intervention will be part of the court records that may ultimately be read by the Supreme Court justices. And if they find any merit to them, they might lift it out and uh, incorporate it into their final decision. Anyway, that's the hope. So uh, that gives you an idea of the sort of thing I do in my spare time. Now, uh, also in the news, here in San Antonio, in Austin, uh, we have a community college, Austin Community College, ACC for short. The last five years they've been conducting a Constitution Day event. And they're having one tomorrow. It is at the Palm Palmer Events Center. That's in uh, just south of the river in, here in Austin. Uh, it is, the participants will be ACC students, uh, and they will be gathered into groups to discuss constitutional issues. And we have a number of volunteer guides and facilitators to uh, help them uh, provide them with information on <coughs> constitutional topics and to help uh, guide them and keep, keep them on track. So uh, that's what we're going to be doing tomorrow. Uh, and uh, if you are interested in being a facilitator, uh, contact me and I'll put you in touch with the organizers and maybe uh, uh, you can help out. <coughs> now, on another front, I have uh, done what I've been meaning to do for a long time, which is to uh, create a draft of an actual bill proposing my nullification commission amendment. Now previously I had a summary of it which was generic in that it could be more or less applied to, to, you know, to any state, but uh, the Tenth Amendment Center asked me for a draft bill to be added to their collection of model legislation. So I, dr I drafted one, and here it is. If you go to uh, nullification from our homepage, you can uh, do, click on it and see how a the, le the le legislature introduces a bill to amend the Texas Constitution. Now there's a standard format that is recommended. There is a manual for uh, how to, dra to uh, draft legislation and in particular how to draft bills to amend the Texas Constitution. So one needs to follow this format. And it's useful to know what that format is so we can go over this uh, bill. It's called a joint resolution. The uh, standard for amending the Constitution in Texas is to do it as a joint resolution. Now there's some question about that where the constitutionally the governor has to sign a bill to propose an amendment to the Constitution. A joint resolution does require the governor's signature. If the U.S. Congress does not have to get the president's signature if they propose a resol a, an amendment. And although they commonly do use joint resolutions, 
they do so improperly when they do it it's supposed to be a concurrent resolution a concurrent resolution is a resolution adopted by both houses but not signed by either the president for the, in the case of Congress or the governor in the case of a state. Now, the standard language then is joint resolution and at the top here we have the, it's supposed to have a summary of what it is that the, uh, uh, what it's supposed to do. So we say a joint resolution proposing a constitutional amendment relating to the establishment of a state grand jury for the review of the constitutionality of the actions of United States government officials and agents and to authorize state grand juries to investigate public administration. Now by way of explanation, uh, there are now no state grand juries. Uh, grand juries are organized under uh, county and district courts. So, uh, <clears throat> but, count, but county, we call them county grand juries for short, are generally under the domination of county district attorneys. And that's a problem. Uh, the Constitution gives county district attorneys dibs on prosecutions. So if the Attorney General wanted to prosecute something in court, he would have to either have a DA do it or he would have to get permission of the court to come in and provide the prosecutor. Uh, what I'm doing here is proposing grand juries that are statewide and that are not under the control of any particular court or under the undue influence of any particular prosecutor. Uh, and this would be a major innovation in the, in the law in Texas. So uh, uh, the language may seem to be very simple, but it's profound and important. Now we say, be it resolved by the legislature of the state of Texas, section one, there are three sections. And just summarize what they are. Section one uh, contains the actual amendment. Section two contains temporary provisions. Um, when you, when the legislature proposes an amendment, in the same resolution in which it proposed the amendment, it can have temporary provisions which are, do not become part of the Constitution, but which are transitional in nature. So if you have a uh, new uh, provision of the Constitution that uh, makes it unclear how to start something up, in the transitional provision can provide the steps needed to get it started. And then finally the third section uh, says that the proposal of constitutional amendment shall be submitted to the voters at an election to be held date. The ballot shall be printed to provide for voting for or against the proposition. And then in quotes you have the summary that would actually appear on the ballot. So uh, the, um, the voters are not going to see the entire amendment on the ballot. They're only going to see this summary. But it's important to word it in a way that's not confusing, that lets the voters know what is they're really voting on. So I tried to do that here. And what the summary says is the constitutional amendment to establish State grand juries, one called the Federal Action Review Commission, to hear citizen complaints about the constitutionality of the actions of federal officials or agents, and if it finds them unconstitutional, to authorize and direct non-cooperation with such actions by state officials, agents, and contractors. And the second kind, 
to investigate official misconduct and public administration. So we're So we're establishing two kinds of grand juries. Uh, one, the Federal Action Review Commission, and the second, uh, uh, to investigate official misconduct in public administration. Now, what I'm proposing is two new sections to be added under the general provisions uh, section, our article of the Texas Constitution, which is Article 16. And so it leads in here, Article 16, Texas Constitution, is amended, amended by adding Section 74 and 75 to read as follows. Now Section 74 and 75 are just the next available numbers. Uh, nothing in this amendment changes anything in the existing Constitution, so it doesn't have to repeal anything. All it has to do is just add stuff. So Section 74 uh, specifies the Federal Action Review Commission, and uh, subsection A a state grand jury to be called the Federal Action Review Commission, here and after commission in this section, shall be impaneled as provided below and shall meet as often as they choose or at, as the legislature may direct, but no less than once a month. B, the commission shall be empowered to review the constitutionality of current or proposed federal legislation regulations, practices, rules, decisions, or other actions. The Commission shall base its findings on a presumption of non-authority and shall require strict proof of constitutionality from logical and textual analysis and historical evidence, not court precedent. C. If the Commission finds sub such actions to be unconstitutional, it may issue an edict with the force of law requiring that no state or local officials, employees, or contractors cooperate in the enforcement of such usurpation and urging state citizens to voluntarily refuse to cooperate. It may only report findings of unconstitutionality. D. The Commission shall consist of 23 members who shall serve for staggered terms of six months each, except initially. And it's the except initially that requires the, the transitional provision. E. Members of the Commission shall be selected at random, that is, by sortition, from a pool of candidates one nominated by the grand jury of each county throughout the state at least once a year or more often as, as the legislature may direct from among constitutionally knowledgeable persons excluding public employees, contractors, or pensioners, active lawyers, or current members. <clears throat> F. The Secretary of State shall administer the random drawing of the members of the Commission and if he should fail to do so, then the State Attorney General shall do so. The Commission shall elect its four person, adopt rules of procedure, hear direct complaints from citizens, and have a quorum of 16 with a vote of 12 required to issue a report. Vacancy shall be filled by random drawing from the same pool. H. The Commission shall be open direct to correct complaints by any citizen subject only to orderly rescheduling which it shall prescribe. I. The Commission shall have the power to subpoena witnesses enforced by any court it may designate. 
J. Deliberations of the Commission shall be secret, except that it may disclose anything in its reports. K. The, the Commission may authorize criminal prosecutions by issuing an indictment to any person, not necessarily a lawyer, upon a finding that the court cited in the indictment has jurisdiction and that evidence of guilt is sufficient for trial. L. State and local officials, employees, and contractors shall be duly notified in writing of commission edicts within 10 days and shall have 20 days to comply or be subject to termination after one written warning and a second failure to refuse to cooperate with public, with federal officials and agents. No official, employee, or contractor shall be penalized for compliance with an edict of the Commission. M. The Legislature is authorized to establish a state fund to pay for private legal counsel and provide financial support of state citizens and agents who refuse to cooperate with unconstitutional federal actions with the intention to obtain judicial decisions that support the unconstitutionality of the federal actions and hold the resisting citizen harmless. The N. The legislature is authorized to enact legislation needed to implement this section. Members shall be compensated on the same terms as other grand jurors in the state. Section 75. State Grand Juries A. At least one state grand jury, and as many more as the legislature may provide, shall be impaneled and shall operate in the same manner as specified in Article 16, Section 74, D through K. B. State Grand Juries prescribed under this section shall be empowered to hear citizen complaints about misconduct or public, of public officials and to investigate public administration, state or local, at its own initiative. But no such state grand jury shall devote more than one-fourth of its working hours to indictments and, if more time is needed, may itself convene additional grand juries of the same kind up to a maximum of ten. C. The legislature authorized to in is authorized to enact legislation needed to implement this section. Members shall be compensated on the same terms as other grand jurors in the state. And then under section two, the following temporary provision is added to the Texas Constitution. The first eight members selected of the Federal Action Review Commission and each state grand jury shall serve for six months and the second eight for four months, and the last seven for two months. So, there you have it laid out, and it's subject to further revision. I'm still working on it, and I'm open to suggestions uh, for improvements. But uh, you can go to uh, constitution.org, click on nullification, and uh, uh, find it there, and uh, uh, you are welcome and encouraged to uh, send copies to other to people in other states. We need to spread this as widely as possible. Uh, we need to form groups in every state to uh, support it and in their states. Uh, now Texas is not going to meet again its legislature for another two years. Well, you're one and a half years now where it's but uh, uh, other states are, have legislatures that are more or less continuous session, so they present an opportunity to introduce such legislation there. Now, the legislation would have to be adapted to each state. Uh, each, one, each state is a little bit different. Uh, and it will probably, most states are going to have their own drafting manuals. Uh, the number of grand jury of Federal Action Review Commission uh, candidates
from each county will have to be changed. Uh, the design objective here is to have at least 230 candidates, 10 times the number of grand jurors, and to, uh, so that the random selection is one out of 10 at random. And so you have plenty of spares in case some of them drop out, you can draw another one at random as necessary to fill vacancies. Um, so the idea would be have the, the pool continuously renewed, you know, month by month, year by year, uh, so it's always available for drawing uh, members, uh, and then to stagger their uh, terms of service so that you have continuity, so you always have some members that are familiar with what's been going on before and can brief the new members and uh, continuing new blood to come in and uh, uh, you know provide a fre fresh perspective on things. So uh, things are done a little bit differently but in many ways except for the staggered terms of service this is actually closer to the way that grand juries are supposed to have been set up in Texas. Right now the Constitution, and it's actually written in the Constitution, only provides for county local grand juries to consist of 12 persons. And that's wrong. Uh, a grand jury is supposed to consist of 23 persons. Federal grand juries are 23 persons. They, they follow the original standard of due process that we inherited when this country was founded. Uh, the rule is that for a grand jury to make a decision, at least 12 must concur. And uh, you could have a grand jury of 12, but they would have to be unanimous. So, uh, uh, in order for a grand jury to make decisions by majority vote, for a bare majority, it would need to have uh, a, a, just a little bit less than twice 12, which is 23. So, this is the proposal. I invite all of you to download it. I sent an uh, uh, email to the uh, members of this meetup group so that you have uh, copies of the uh, this resolution and your and the attachments but again you should go back to the website for the latest version because I may be tweaking this some uh, in response to suggestions so uh, this is where we stand at this point uh, I've been trying to be busy here uh, and uh, Hopefully, uh, uh, this will come to some fruition. Uh, to review the efforts of the nullification proponents, uh, there have been a number of nullification bills introduced in several states, and none of them have went anywhere. Uh, part of the reason for this, in my opinion, is that the bills were not very well designed. Uh, they provoked a lot of opposition, which I don't think that this bill, this bill would have stimulated. You know, some of them were basically called for uh, criminalizing uh, federal agents who tried to, uh, for example, enforce the health care mandate. Well, there's no way that's going to be enforceable. All they can do is just, you know, set up uh, any state, state official who tried to enforce it or being prosecuted himself. Uh, any state prosecution would be immediately, you know, removed to federal court and dismissed. So, uh, any proposal of this kind needs to understand the law well enough to know how any such proposal would could and sh would play out step by step by step if it were actually adopted and implemented. And uh, the other proposals don't do that. 
this one does. And uh, hopefully uh, now that activists have had a run at, at proposing bad legislation, maybe now they'll uh, propose something that's good. At least in, it's good in my opinion. Obviously, uh, I have some pride of authorship, but uh, uh, putting that aside, I, it seems to stand up well to uh, commentary by other people, you know, experts and scholars whose opinion I respect. Uh, so, with redistricting and nullification efforts, we have uh, several other things that are of interest. We go back to the home page. I've been doing a lot of blogging lately. Well, I always do, I always do a lot of blogging. We can go here to the Constitution blog. We'll open that in a new tab. And we have a debate concerning the uh, individual mandate, whether or not it's a tax. Whether it's a tax affects uh, whether or not the Supreme Court will cons hold it constitutional or not. If pre previous precedents on taxes uh, support taxing almost anything and using a tax for almost any purpose, if it's not a tax, if it's a regulation, then the precedents don't support such broad uh, action, and it may in fact be held unconstitutional. We had a recent, uh, uh, we now have one appellate level decision, the 11th Circuit, which has overturned uh, the individual mandate, but not the whole uh, Health Care Act, whereas the district court below it had overturned the entire Health Care Act. So other circuits have, uh, you know, divided. We have uh, a couple where that have sustained the Health Care Act, and uh, we have one other that has uh, overturned it. So uh, this seems likely to be headed for the Supreme Court and is an active area of debate on the various forums, such as the Vault Conspiracy, to which I post often. and. Uh, I recommend that you uh, visit it. Uh, here is a post on uh, my intervention in the Texas redistricting case. A report on the individual mandate going down in the 11th. And then I have a post here about a way around the debt ceiling in which I point out that uh, the uh, there is a danger, this was at a, at a post at a time when there was still a debate about whether to raise the debt ceiling, but I pointed out that even if the debt ceiling were not raised, that there's nothing to prevent the Federal Reserve from just paying the government's bills directly, from just issuing the printing money out of thin air and sending it to, uh, to vendors, to the states, to anybody else, uh, and without, without loaning the money to the government. Uh, this would not add to the debt, uh, it would not exceed the debt ceiling, and yet it would uh, allow uh, what would amount to government spending without limit. And of course, one of the things it would also do is to uh, generate hyperinflation. So n almost nobody thought of this. <coughs> and there are a lot of things that uh, the people you would think, who should think of, don't think of. And sometimes uh, the only way you can find out, you know, what they overlooked is to come to my website or my blogs.
Now, I've also been posting, there's another blog, it's not linked from constitution.org directly. Uh, this is called Hobbiter Dictum. And I'll just enter it in manually. Hobbiter Dictum is for commentary that uh, is not necessarily related to the Constitution. This is more for policy discussions. So, uh, I have a post here on alternatives to Social Security, which I call uh, the, the Ponzi scheme, in quotes. And I discuss the, the uh, alternatives such as the one being proposed or that was adopted by Galveston and some neighboring counties. But basically what I point out is that the model adopted by Chile uh, is the way to go except for one thing. It can't constitutionally be done at the na national level in the United States because there is no authority in the con U.S. Constitution to, uh, to, to do that. Uh, the, the system adopted by Chile is mandatory and there's no authority to make such a thing mandatory at the federal level. So it would have to be done state by state or even by locality by locality. But uh, if it were done, that would, I think, get become a viable alternative to Social Security and we could avoid the uh, problems that we're going to face with Social Security. In our next post here, I have a posting about cancel all debts, uh, which sounds like a uh, uh, stark thing to say. But if you read it back in history, one of the things that has commonly happened with countries that have undergone economic collapse is that the government just orders, often by edict, that all debts are canceled. Well, most of those historical examples occurred before there was uh, fiat currency as legal tender in most countries. If you were to cancel all debts today, you'd have to also cancel all currency. And uh, I discuss, you know, alternatives to fiat currency. Uh, one would be to go out to and mine an asteroid. There is an asteroid called 2010. AU-79. Which is a real asteroid. I see a picture of it here. And by doing a, an analysis of the spectrum of it, uh, which is basically looking at the surface, so we don't know what's in the interior of it, but from what we can see on the surface, uh, it's about, it seems to be about 10% gold. This is a big asteroid. And if 10% of it is gold, uh, that would be a hundred times more gold than all the gold that's ever been discovered on Earth. So if we were to mine that asteroid, uh, we could uh, create uh, blocks of metal foam that would look, it would look kind of like pumice, you know, that comes out of volcanoes. You, you have a form, you inject molten metal into it combined with gas and inside the form, because you're in weightless space, it would form a foam, in other words it would be lighter than water, you could form it in the form of a lifting body, sort of similar to a space shuttle with a delta shape. You could send it into a glide, gliding path into the, into the Earth's atmosphere. 
and have it land in an ocean where it'd be picked up by ship, brought back into port, and sliced up and turned into uh, gold coins or whatever else you want to do with it. So there is a way that we can get enough gold to make it practical as a backing for currency or as currency itself. And the other thing would be to base currencies on units of energy, like jewels. So uh, that has been a, a proposal I put out there. Now another subject, an active area of controversy, is uh, the question, uh, Pal the Palestinians are seeking recognition in the UN <coughs> as an independent state. The US and of course Israel and some other countries are opposing it. It is problematic from several viewpoints, including in the best, what's in the best interest of the Palestinians. But in response to a, a New York Times op-ed by Turkey Al-Faisal, former Saudi intelligence minister, uh, I am proposed to uh, resolve the impasse by recognizing not a single Palestinian state, but multiple Palestinian states. In other words, my proposal would be to recognize the, city, the Palestinian cities, Hebron, Nablus, Jenin, Ramallah, Bethlehem, Jericho, Gaza, perhaps uh, Eastern Jerusalem, as cities, independent city states, each administering a block of territory surrounding it, which would be connected by roads or uh, corridors, and uh, which we federated into a federation. Uh, each one would evolve its ability to govern itself and its people, and when it was ready to for function as a single coherent state, that has effective control over its own pe people, then they could unite together. So the idea is to provide a way by which the Palestinians can evolve into a state. Uh, because I don't think they're ready for it yet. They can't control their own people. And as one of the qualifications for statehood needs to be that it has effective control over its own territory. So if you go to Obiter Dictum, you can find a lot of uh, uh, interesting commentary. Much of it does touch on constitutional issues, but uh, only in minor ways, and it uh, allows the two subjects to be kept somewhat separated. I also bring up a little bit of history here. Uh, the map of parts of the Middle East, in particular Pakistan and Afghanistan, the boundary between them is called the Durand Line. It was uh, drafted by uh, Mortimer Durand, then former secretary of British India, in 1893, and his objective was to uh, draw a line between India and the Pashtun controlled territory northwest of the line, which became Afghanistan. The Pashtuns were a big thorn in the side of Britain, and rather than giving the Pashtuns their own nation state, uh, Duran's idea was to divide them into two states, keep them divided and maybe fighting one another. Well, we're suffering from the result of that decision to this day. Uh, the federally administrated tri tribal areas in Pakistan are basically the Pashtun areas uh, that should have been on the 
other side of the line when Duran draw, drew it, in my view. And uh, on the other hand, if you go to Afghanistan, you, you see which areas are dominated by which ethnic groups. You'll see that northern Afghanistan, dominated by what we, is generally called the Northern Alliance, are mainly Dari-speaking people, the Tajiks and others, uh, whereas the southern Afghanistan is dominated by Pashtuns, who speak the language Pashtun, along with most of the people in the uh, federally administrated, uh, administered tribal areas of Pakistan, which Pakistan just does not control. It claims it, it has outposts there, but it really doesn't control it, and it doesn't control what it goes on from that territory. So what I propose on, in this article is to uh, uh, solve the problem by uh, redrawing the map to ask pa Pakistan to give up that territory, which it doesn't control anyway, allow, uh, encourage Afghanistan to be divided into Daristan and Pashtunistan and have the two Pashtun areas unite into one country, perhaps to be called Pashtunistan. And uh, then let them work out among themselves how to govern themselves. And I figure that after they uh, go through the process of learning how to govern themselves, they may be a lot less of a threat to the rest of the world and to their neighbors. So uh, again, no one it seems to have, else has been seen to have thought of this, uh, but I propose it and uh, I've been getting some favorable comments on it. And uh, if you want to read about it, you can go to, can read about it on our, my blogs and my websites. Uh, that should be enough for this evening. Uh, I will call it an evening now, and uh, this will be posted online for anyone to view it. Thank you and good evening.